Let's hold up our Bible and let's make this confession together. I thank you, Father, that your word has the power to change my life. Today, I give heed to it. I allow it to go into my ears, then into my mind, and then into my spirit. I'm a hearer of the word and a doer of the word. And I'll never be the same after today, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I believe that there are two major mistakes that are made in the Christian walk. One of them is when we expect God to fix everything for us and we don't move ahead in the authority that God has given to us. We're waiting on God when God's waiting on us. And sometimes we need to just move ahead with some things, particularly, uh, let's talk about some things that were purchased for us at the cross. Healing was purchased for you at the cross. Healing belongs to you. So oftentimes people are just waiting, when is God going to heal me? Not realizing that Jesus paid for that healing on the cross and then what we need to do is stand on the word and believe his word and trust and have faith and confidence in him and don't let go. And you'll see healing manifest in your life. Uh, Another one is overcoming discouragement. Some of us, uh, we can, if we're not careful, discouragement can set into our heart, can set into our life, and we don't really know what the issue is, what the problem is, but we just kind of feel like God can fix it. When, in reality, God has provided for us his word and the power of his spirit, and the, in the power of his spirit, we have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, meekness, gentleness, and self-control. We have those things already on the inside of us, and so we just need to draw on the peace and the joy that's on the inside of us. Uh, recognizing the harvest that we have. When, when's God going to bless me? I thought that if I tithed and I gave, that God was going to bless me. You know, we really need to get good as Christians at recognizing what's already around us. God has already provided for our needs. You know, how many of us would honestly say if we had back the money that we have misspent over the last 10 years, we could probably pay for everything we need to pay for and more? So God's providing, are we good stewards of what God is providing for us? So the first major mistake that people make is leaving everything up to God to fix instead of moving ahead in the authority of God and what God has already provided for us. But the second major mistake uh, that I want to talk about today is trying to fix everything yourself, not recognizing that the Holy Spirit is at work in your present circumstances. Jesus' finished work on the cross not only provided for us to be redeemed from the curse of disease and poverty, those things, but also provided for the release of the Holy Spirit with, upon, and within every believer. The Holy Spirit is mainly at work in the hearts of men. The Holy Spirit does work in circumstances. When, you know, when are you going to... The Holy Spirit doesn't do kind of... Sometimes people feel like that the Holy Spirit, he levitates things and he, and he, he, you know, he, does, he, does, he does things out there. But mainly what the Holy Spirit does is work inside the hearts of men so that we then can walk in the authority and the power and the wisdom that God has given to us. Now... When he works in our hearts, he brings us closer to God and reveals his plan to us as it unfolds. But I want you to understand today that he also works in the hearts of others in the same way. The Holy Spirit's mainly at work in the hearts of men, and he works in our hearts. He's bringing us closer to the plan of God, the purpose of God, the destiny of God. But not only is he doing that in our lives, but people that you know that have challenges, difficulties, frustrations, people that you know that frustrate you? Or does anybody know anybody that frustrates you? The Holy Spirit is also at work in their heart and in their life. So 
I want you to, to pay attention to the graphic that I have up here. This series that we've been talking about today is the fourth week. It's called Love Triangle. And what I have up here on the, uh, uh, on the screen is, for those of you that are listening by CD or listening online, uh, what I have up here is the love triangle. I have a triangle up here that has God at the top, the husband on the left side, the wife on the right side. I have the wife on the right side because the wife's always right. Uh, just want you, to, those of you that are just listening and not seeing the graphic, I want you to get this in your mind. Now, in seasons of harmony, we go through seasons of harmony in our relationships with each other. Whether And, and what I'm going to teach you today, the principles that I'm going to teach you today, will work not only between husbands and wives. It will work between siblings. It will work between parents and kids and vice versa. It will work with you and your boss. It will even work between you and your neighbors. Today, the context is marriage. But I want you to keep in mind that this triangle that I'm going to show you in the flow, the love triangle flow, will work between anybody. What I want you to see here is that uh, we go through seasons right here where everything seems to be flowing well. We go through seasons of harmony with others, harmony with our spouse when life is good. When we go through seasons of harmony here where communication is good, where cooperation is high, where understanding is flowing. Everybody's feelings are being considered. Oh, honey, I, I can't believe I hurt your feet. I'm so, I, will you please forgive me? Oh, it's, uh, it's okay, honey. I was just being a little bit sensitive. Oh, no, but I need to be taking better care of you. And I mean, everything's flowing and life is good. <laughs> but then there are situations of disharmony where things are challenging. Where we have periods of disharmony. Those periods of disharmony right here are where communication is challenging. Misunderstanding dominates the relationship. You're not listening to me. No, you're not listening to me. I started first. Listen to me. No, you listen to me. Lack of cooperation is the result right here. Everybody's feelings are taking a beating. And then we begin to make emotionally irrational decisions in this environment. Not a show of hands, just a question. How many of you have ever been in this situation where you made a really stupid decision? Because you were emotionally irrational. No, don't, don't raise your hands. He was on the back row, so I'm not going to tell you who it is. I'm not going to tell you that Adolph Roy raised his hand just then. Uh, <laughs> when we go through periods of disharmony or misunderstanding with others, including but not limited to our husband or our wife. We want to be sure, first of all, that the main problem is not us. Yeah, right. Because sometimes it is us. Sometimes you ever felt like it was the other person only to discover you were the bonehead? Yeah, got a few hands on that one. You want to be sure, first of all, that the main problem is not you in the difficulty here. You want to make sure that your communication skills are solid. Mainly, and, and can I just tell you the key? There is one big key. There are books that are written and seminars that are done on communication. There is one main key to communication that will save your life. And that is, be sure that you listen twice as much as you talk. We were given two ears and one mouth for a reason. We're to listen twice as much as we talk. And have you ever been guilty of while somebody is trying to talk with you, that you're, rather than listening to them, you're thinking about what you're going to come back with? You can't wait for them to, get, to stop talking so you can make your next point. And the reason that we get into arguments is because we feel like that the more we talk, you know, if I could just say one more thing, they're going to get it. If I, could, if I could just, this one more thing, if I could just get this, if they'll, if they'll hurry up and then I could say this, then the light will come on and they'll go, oh, you were right all along. And it just doesn't happen that way. Good communicators, good personal communicators, good communicators in marriage are people that know how to listen before they talk. 
And we need to get good at that. And most of us, honestly, are not. A good way to, one thing that uh, we teach in our uh, pre-marriage class is learning to, uh, learning to listen and then repeat back to the person who talked with you what they said to be sure that communication was clear. Now, I understood you to say this. Um, have you ever said something that made somebody mad and you don't know what you said? Well, what did I say? You know what you said. Well, actually... And, guy, and gals, you got to cut us some slack because we don't know. We really, we don't know. What are you so mad about? I mean, did I say something wrong? Did you say something wrong? Did I? You know what you said. We don't have a clue. We really don't. You got to tell us. You got to tell us. Oh, oh, I was right. You got to tell us what we said wrong. Uh, but good communication is when we can repeat back to, before you get mad, and, uh, uh, you know, I'm praying for couples to get for the individual in your family that likes to fight to get delivered from that. Because sometimes there are people in the relationship that actually like to fight. And if that's you, you need deliverance from that. You need to ask God to deliver you from that. But uh, in order to avoid arguments in a relationship, it's really pretty simple I can't tell you the couples that have been in my office and they're this close to a divorce. And I listen to this one and then I listen to that one. And then I ask a question here and I qu ask a question there and I find out both of them are saying the same thing. And neither one of them is listening to the other one. And if you'll just be quiet, and ah, let them talk. Ah, let them talk. Ah. Okay, now, you repeat back to him what he just said. I, I, she's, she's talking. Be quiet. Repeat to him back what he, what he just said. Okay, is that what you said? It's not. Okay, then you tell her again. What you, now, let him talk. Go ahead and tell him what you said. Tell him again. Or tell her again, rather. Okay, now, you repeat back to him what you just heard again. Okay, did you hear that? Now, is that what you meant to say? That's what you meant to say. Okay, what's your problem with what he just said? And they both look at each other and go, I don't have a problem with what he just said. And the whole problem is that they're not listening to each other. And listening is a vital key. Just learning to listen would save so many marriages. Uh, so um, being sure that you have good communication skills. Thirdly, that we as husbands are loving our wives as Christ loves the church. And that we as wives are showing honor to our husbands as we do to Christ. And I'm not going to explore that anymore. Uh, Connie and I have got all kinds of resources in the bookstore. Really good marriage and family resources that we've taught. We've been teaching for years on that. And we've got a CD sets uh, in there and confession CDs for marriage and all that stuff. So go avail yourself of that. And particularly if you want husbands, you want to know how to love your wife as Christ loved the church. Uh, get our, our uh, series on that. We, and I've got several, not just one. And the same thing for wives who want to honor, honor their husbands as they do Christ. But I do want to say this. You need to stay focused on the one that is your responsibility, either to love or to honor. Sometimes I hear wives say, my, the Bible says that my husband is supposed to love me as Christ loves the church, and he doesn't do that. But the Bible never says to wives, be sure your husbands love you. It says, wives, honor your husbands as you honor Christ. And then I hear husbands say, you know, I talk to my wife and I try to work with my wife. But the, wife say, the Bible says that uh, my wife is supposed to uh, honor me and my wife w doesn't honor me. My wife is, is dishonoring and insulting and, and, uh, and uh, excuse me, sir, the Bible never says, husbands, be sure your wives honor you. It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. So I believe that if husbands will love their wives as Christ loved the church, it will make it easy for their wives to honor them. Amen. Anybody here? Yes. I believe that if wives will honor their husbands as they honor Christ, that it will make it easy for their husbands to love them. So let's focus on what our responsibility is. So 
there are situations in our life where there is disharmony here, and we want to be sure that we're doing everything communication-wise, the husband loving his wife, the wife honoring her husband. We want to be sure that everything here is flowing the best that we can. But sometimes, sometimes we can do our very, very best to be sure that our part of this is going well, and we may not be doing it perfectly, but we're doing our best with what we know to do. And it's still there are still issues. There's still frustration. There are still difficulties that are happening. We still feel like that we're not getting anywhere. But I want you to know that the Holy Spirit is still at work. We need to learn to trust God even when we don't even trust the other person. You can trust God. I want you to look with me at uh, Ephesians chapter 6 that I had you turn to when we began this message. Do you have it? Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 says, Finally, my brethren, and this goes for the cisterns too, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be with, able to stand against the tricks of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. I want you to know that the devil hates your marriage. The Bible says that where two or more agree as touching anything on earth, it will be done of the Father in heaven. And there is no greater union, no greater agreement on earth than that agreement between a husband and a wife. And so God, pardon me, Deanne, I need a handkerchief, please. I need one for my nose and one to wave as I'm preaching. Actually, no, I'm Steve. I just need one. Thank you. Pardon me a moment. Thank you. That the devil hates your marriage and he hates that union. You're the most powerful couple on earth when it comes to the power of agreement working and you get a husband and wife who are willing to stand in agreement even in spite of the conflict in spite of the difficulty in spite of the misunderstanding that they're willing to stand on the word and speak the word together they are not only inseparable but there is nothing that they can't accomplish there's nothing that they can't work through can you say amen to that so the Bible says here that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, and sometimes we think she's the problem, and it ain't her. Sometimes we think he's the problem, and it's really interesting to talk with couples and see when couples have so much difficulty in their lives, what a fog that they're in, just a real not seeing things clearly. And the enemy, the Bible says that the devil is the author of confusion. God is not the author of confusion. And when you find confusion in your relationship, that is a sure sign that the enemy is at work. And so what you need to do is stay focused on your role, whether it's as the wife uh, honoring her husband or as the husband in loving your wife. You need to stay focused on your role, and then you need to realize that God is at work, the Holy Spirit's at work, and it's not just between the two of you here. It's not just this, but God is at work. Let's talk about that. This says, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And then it talks about the armor of God. I'm not going to teach on the armor of God today. Again, we've got a series in the bookstore on the armor of God. And uh, uh, verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And then verse 18. Once we have realized that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and rulers of the darkness of this world, the Bible says that we are to not put on the armor of God and then have at it with each other. I've got the armor of God on and I'm going to crush you. The Bible says that we are to put on the armor of God and then verse 18 says we are to... Pray. 
you know, things look a lot different up here than they do down here. The Bible says that once we, husbands, once we have put on the armor of God, we're to recognize our battle is not against flesh and blood, so our problem is not her. And we're to put on the whole armor of God. We're to uh, arm ourselves with the word of God. It says the sword of the spirit is what? How many people are here? How many of you turned in your Bible to where I told you to turn to? The sword of the spirit is what? The word of God. And so we take the word of God with us. That's our weapon. And we don't, we're not going to crush our wife with it. Or lecture our wife with it. Amen, ladies. We're not going to lecture our wife with it. But we're to take the sword of the spirit with the word of God. And we are to pray. So what does the Bible say about our wives? My wife loves me as... Uh, my wife honors me and my wife respects me as she does the Lord. What does the Bible say, wives, about your husband? The Bible says that your husband loves you as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And you take that word and you pray it. And you say, Father, I thank you that my husband loves me as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Even if it doesn't look like it. When we're prepared for battle, we're to go to prayer. We're not to battle here. Too many of us are battling here. Is this making sense to anybody? Yes. Too many of us are, we're battling, the battle's here, no. The battle is when we go to God with the word, and guess what, then God fights our battles for us. There should be, it'd be good if there was an arrow coming down here, just imagine there's an arrow here. Uh, I wish I, I, they put this, this is exactly how I told them to make this. So it's not anybody's fault but mine, but I wish that arrow wasn't here. I wish there was an arrow here and an arrow here. Because then when we take our battles to God, God fights our battles for us. Psalm chapter 16, verse 17 and 18 says, I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. This is Psalm chapter 16, verse 7 through 11. I set the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures for every, forevermore. And so this is talking about learning to take our issues to God and in his presence is where peace is when there's no peace here there's peace here so let me talk with you about how the love triangle actually works first of all you attempt to communicate each with each other and I'm my confession is and what I believe in for you is that your confession between your and your uh, communication between you and your, sp you and your spouse is really good. You communicate well. You listen well. You, not only do you listen, but that, how many of you know it's frustrating when you listen well, but the, your spouse doesn't listen well? You know, I feel like I'm given 110% and they're given 5%. Uh, but what, what I'm believing for, for for you is that your communication is solid. My, uh, I got to have this right here. Uh, I need another battery in this or something. You got to fix this so it works. I have no idea what's wrong with it. I just need for it to work. I don't care if you bang on it or bite it or what. There you go. It's working. Hand it back here. That's exactly. I just needed, just needed your, hey, you're going to need to come up here and do this for me because it doesn't, it's not working. What did you do? Ha. Ah. Don't anybody move. All right. It's working. Okay. Thank you, Dan, for whatever you did. So I want to talk with you about how the love triangle works. First of all, you speak to each other and you attempt to communicate together. And hopefully your communication is good. Hopefully you're respecting each other's feelings. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you're in a harmonious time and that's going well. But when you attempt to communicate here and that is not going well, the other person doesn't seem to be listening. They don't see your point, which, is, which of course is always right. So then, when this is not going well, I don't need to belabor this, do, do I? Everybody know what I'm talking about here when this is not going well? Two people know. Everybody else is. Anybody else here? Everybody, everybody know what I'm talking about when I'm saying this maybe not is, is not going well? 
Okay, so when that's not going well, the next thing is, let's start with, let's just take the wife's side here. Then the wife, rather than continuing to escalate this conversation and this conflict, put a smile on your face, say, I love you, dear, and you take it to God. Step number three, when you take this to God, and you talk to God about the issues. God, I'm, I'm praying for my husband. I'm speaking the word over my husband. He doesn't get this. This is not working. That's not working. I need your help with my husband, God. So I'm bringing this to you. You, the Bible says that in the presence of God, there are pleasures and there's fullness of what? joy so you can smile and you can you don't have to get in the fray of all the conflict you take it to God and you leave it with him you smile and you let God take care of it so the third thing that happens is God speaks to them some of you don't have much confidence in this do you God, if you leave this with God, God, I'm going to explain to you in a minute why this doesn't work for some. Some of you are going, ah, I tried that. That didn't work. I'm going to explain to you why in just a minute. But God speaks to then, speaks to your husband. And this is one of the reasons why patience is the third fruit of the Holy Spirit. Actually, it's the fourth. Love, joy, peace, and then patience. Patience means I know you want to pray this morning and you want God to show him by this afternoon. Which generally, as a rule, does not happen. It could be anywhere from a week to three months or longer. However long it takes for God to speak to them. But that's the third thing that happens. Number one, you attempt to communicate. Hopefully that's going well. But if you're in a season where that's not going well, number two, you give it to God and you pray the word uh, over, over your husband. And then God speaks to your husband. Let's ask a question. In God speaking to your husband, you want to be sure that you are not in the way. Because, and I've seen this. I've seen this firsthand. I've seen God because I've had your husband in my office. And God is trying to speak to your husband, but he can't hear God for you. When are you going to start listening to me? When are you going to start doing what I want? How come you didn't when you're here? And God is trying to speak to your husband, and you won't be quiet long enough for him to do it. You gave it to God, and then you took it back, and you keep the conflict going. And so you need, to, you need to have a smile on your face. You need to say, I love you, dear. And you need to give it to God. And you need to let God deal with it and let God talk to your husband. The thing that happens, the fourth step that happens is then your husband comes to you and says, honey, you were right. Honey, I apologize. Honey, I should have seen that. Or, you know, and you know what, you know what happens? Uh, you know, well, they speak to you, okay, and, and tell you what's going on. And then the fifth step is, listen to me, the fifth step is you show love and respect. Not, well, I'm finally glad you came around. It was about time you listened to me. I was, oh, I've been praying and praying and praying and praying, believing that God would speak to you and you would finally come to your senses. Don't do that. Don't do that. You need to be gracious, honey. I love you. And, and listen, I just want what's best for us. And you show love and respect. Now, they may realize that when God speaks to them, they may, may realize that what God is speaking to them is, is what you've been speaking to them. But it's oftentimes, and there are women in this room that can testify to this fact, there are oftentimes that God will speak to the husband, and when the husband speaks to God, the husband thinks that what he's receiving is his idea. That he got directly from God. And he'll come to you and say, guess what God just showed me? Not even remembering that you've been trying to tell him that. John Maxwell says, 
It's amazing what can be accomplished if nobody cares who gets the credit. So you just need to flow with it. Really? You think you got that? So you don't remember for the last six months I've been trying to tell you this? No, sometimes we hear, we hear things from a different source and it sounds different and it's the same thing. I can't tell you the times that we've had guest ministers in this church stand up on this platform and preach a message that I just preached four months ago. People come up to me and say, oh, wait, can we have them back? That was so, I've never heard anything like that in my life. <laughs> I'm thinking, I just, I just said that. I got the notes right here. You may have the notes in your notebook. <laughs> I don't say that. You mean you don't remember when I just said, praise God. Maybe we'll have them back. Aren't they wonderful? And listen, it just, as long as you're getting it, I don't care who you get it from. And so, listen, we need to do that here. We need to realize that, that uh, when the husband hears from God, you don't want to create more conflict by saying, well, you didn't, you didn't get that from God. You got that from me. No, they got that from God. And God was able to say it in a way that they were able to get it. The reason they wouldn't listen to you, maybe, was your delivery. <laughs> now, we've been, I've been picking on wives. Husbands, it's the same thing. It's the same thing for you. Uh, it works both ways, communicating with your wife. If it, hopefully it's working, but if it's not, you go to God and you let God speak to your wife. Same thing, exact same thing. Now, I want you to know that my wife is great at this. I actually learned what I'm, what I'm teaching you right now. I learned from watching her because she's really, really good at this. We don't have a lot of conflicts anymore. I'm not saying that we don't ever disagree, but I'm talking about, I mean, I remember years ago, man, we used to, it was ugly. It was always my fault. I'm not being funny. It was always my fault. And it, we would have some really, really ugly disagreements. But I've watched her talk with me, communicate with me, and if communication with me is not going well, I've seen her take things to God. Just all of a sudden, it's like she just, she just stopped harassing me over it. I was like, okay, I love you, honey. It's, it'll be, God bless you. It'll be fine. And just, and I'm thinking, well, you know, I guess she gave up or she's just not important to her or whatever. No, she's in her prayer closet and she's talking to God about me. And there are times when I have come to her, and, I've, and I'm talking about after a period of weeks or even months, I've come to her and said, honey, guess what? You know, let me share with you what the Holy Spirit's showing me. And, it was, and at the time I shared it with her, I didn't remember. It might have been a few weeks later I realized, no, wait a minute. She tried to tell me that. But I didn't get it at the time. I thought, I was, I thought this was fresh revelation from God. That, that Connie had actually received. She's, she's really, really good at this. And then when I come to her, she never, she never has this I told you so attitude or I'm glad you finally came around or that kind of thing. She's always very respectful and, and very loving. And she just wants the relation. She just wants this to work. You know, she doesn't have to be right all the time. It's okay, it's okay in her eyes if God's right. God shows me and I get it. She's good with it. So I really honor her. For that. Now, something you have to consider, husbands, wives, is when you go to God with your concerns about your spouse or what's going on there, you have to be prepared for the fact that when you take this to God and that, you, and that you're leaving this issue with God, that rather than God going to them with it, he's coming back to you with it. You thought it was their problem. And God's saying, no, it's not them, it's you. You've got to be prepared for that possibility because it can happen. And in my life, it has. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. This is the place of peace. When this is not the place of peace, this is the place of peace. And you go to God with your issues. You go to God with your issues. Deanna, I need you again. You go to God with your, there it is. 
You go to God with your issues with your wife, and you leave them there. And that's the place of peace when you're communicating with God about your situation with your boss, your situation with your kids, your situation with the neighbors, your situation with the relatives. As long as you're trying to work it out between you and your boss, you, well, and that's fitting, isn't it? You and your boss, or you and the neighbors, or you and the kids, and it's just not flowing. you got to find a place of peace here with God. And when you do that, the Bible says that God will keep you in perfect perfect peace if you keep your mind here. And lastly, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto your spouse. It says, let your request be made known to God, and when you do that, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Whenever there's conflict, whenever there's discord here, you want your heart and mind guarded by God, because sometimes we're not good at guarding our own heart and our own mind. Sometimes there's stuff that, that's in our mind. Did you know that, there, that in a period of conflict like this, there's stuff in our heart and in our mind that doesn't need to come out? And you need a guard over your mind here. And so uh, the Word of God and the Spirit of God, will, the Bible says, will, go, will mount guard over our heart and over our mind and protect us if we will keep our minds focused on God. This says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, pray. The reason worry is a sin, it says, be anxious for nothing. Uh, Most of your translations say, don't worry. And the reason worry is a sin is that worry has its roots in fear. The word anxious or worry in the Greek New Testament is the Greek word merimnao, and it means to be hounded by worrisome expectation or anxiety. We're expecting the worst while faith is expecting God's best. And so in your relationship here, what are you expecting? Are you expecting God's best? Then go to God and let God produce his best in your wife. Let God produce his best in your husband. Worry, this is the place of worry. This is the place of rest. Where do you want to live your life? I can tell you, God can see things in your husband that you can't see. The the view is completely different up here than here. And God can see things in your wife you can't see. You can't see them. You're in here. You're in the conflict. You're in the fray, and you can't see what God can see here. But God, from his vantage point, can see the potential and what's happening in the heart of your husband, what's happening in the heart of your wife. Let me read this to you out of the Message Bible. Everybody stand, please. Let me read to you this scripture out of the Message Bible. The Message Bible, Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Listen to me very carefully. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good, will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. Isn't that powerful? I want you to bow your heads with me just for a moment. Father, we thank you for the power of your spirit working in our hearts and in our lives. Forgive us for the times when we kept the conflict going instead of taking the conflict to you. Some of us, God, some of, some of us have enjoyed the conflict way too much. We've tolerated the conflict way too much. And we ask you to forgive us for that. And we commit ourselves. In fact, everybody say this after me. Heavenly Father, I commit myself in times of conflict to smile and to put all my confidence in you. And to take the issues to you. Speaking the word of God. And believing that you will then speak into the situation. And bring about your word. In my husband's life, in my wife's life, in my boss's life, in my children's lives. I thank you that I can put my trust in you 
and you're going to bring your word to pass. So this morning, I'm finding a place of rest amidst any conflict that I'm dealing with, knowing that the vantage point that you're at is much different than where I am. You can see the good. You can see the potential. You can see the progress that's already being made, even when I can't see it. I trust you today. I trust you today. Heavenly Father, I trust you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you get anything out of that word this morning? Amen. Amen. I want to give you an opportunity to make a decision to follow Christ this morning. Maybe you've never been to church. Maybe this is your first time at church. And uh, you've seen the illustrations that we've used today. And you're thinking, I wish I had a lot less conflict in my life. You know, the principles that I've talked about this morning all work in a life that's surrendered to Jesus Christ. God loves you and God has a plan for your life. Because of sin, every person in this room was separated from God. All of us were. But Jesus Christ came and he paid the price for our sin with his death on the cross so that we could be free to serve him, free to fulfill our destiny in God, free to spend eternity with him when we leave this world. And what you need to do is make a decision to follow Christ. And you can do that right there where you're standing. In just a moment, I'm going to pray a prayer with you. Repenting for your sins, acknowledging that Jesus is the Lord of your life, and asking the Holy Spirit to come in and empower you to be the Christian that the Bible promises you that you can be. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Everyone in the building, would you bow your heads? Maybe you've never done this before. Maybe you've never even been to church before. Or maybe you used to serve God and you've fallen away from the Lord. And if you went into eternity today, you're not sure what would happen to you. Today's your day. The Holy Spirit's drawing you into the kingdom of God today. I'm going to pray this prayer with you right there where you are. While every head's bowed and every eye's closed, everybody that wants to pray this prayer with me and everybody that wants to make a decision to follow Christ, I want you to raise your hand real high. Keep it up where I can see it. I'm going to pray this prayer with you right there where you are. Raise your hand now. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I see that hand. Who else would raise your hand and say, I want to make a decision? I see that hand. Who else would raise your hand and say, I want to make a decision to follow Christ? Anyone else? Raise your hand now. I don't see any other hands. You can put your hands down. We've had several people that have raised their hands this morning that want to make decisions to follow Christ. So I'm going to pray a prayer with you right there where you are. In fact, we're all going to pray this with you together because you're about to become our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Let's all bow our heads, close our eyes, and let's all pray this with them together. Heavenly Father, thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. Jesus, thank you that you willingly came and paid the price for my sin with your death on the cross so that I could be free to serve you, free to fulfill my destiny in you, and free to spend eternity with you. So I repent for my sins, and I say, Jesus, you are the Lord of my life. Holy Spirit, come and live on the inside of me now. Empower me to be the Christian that the Bible promises me I can be. As I come to church and I get involved in church life, my life will never be the same after this moment. In Jesus' name, and the people of God shouted amen. Let's give a big hand for all those who made decisions to follow Christ today. Amen. We are so excited for each one of you.